കരുണാർണവമായി കരുതഗതി നൽകും അരുണാചല ശിവം നമസ്തേ so this time we're going to talk about savikalpa samadhi these two verses explain it <laughs> quite nicely text 24 kama drash chitagadrishyas tat sakshir tvana chetanam dhyaye drishyanu vidho yang samadhi savikalpa kaha desire etc centered in the mind are to be treated as cognizable objects meditate on consciousness as their witness this is called savikalpa samadhi associated with cognizable objects text 25 asanga sachidananda sva prabho dvaita varjitah asmiti shabda vidho yang samadhi savikalpa kaha I am existence consciousness bliss unattached self luminous and free This is the other kind of savikalpa samadhi associated with a sound object So these are the two main kinds of savikalpa samadhi as described in the previous texts What's the difference Well in the first kind of samadhi one observes the mind and when any thought comes up like a desire for example or maybe a memory something like that one observes it acknowledges it and then notes that this is not me this is not who i am this is not myself neti neti remember In other words, we remain unattached and neutral to the thought. We don't try to grasp it or push it away. We simply observe it and realize that consciousness is different from its objects. Drig drishya viveka. Huh? This is the title of the book and that's the method that is primarily used in the beginning stage of savikalpa. then in the higher stage one creates an object for meditation within the mind that has the attributes of satchit ananda and identifies with that attribute as this is me uh, this is myself this is who i am what well, what are we doing here well remember three or four shlokas back The shloka said various cognizable objects have five attributes being consciousness bliss name and form The first three sat chit ananda belong to brahman the other two nama rupa belong to form to matter to the world So what we're doing here is that we're using our viveka discrimination to distinguish between the cognizable objects and the cognizer <laughs> between the seer and the seen drig drishya viveka If this all sounds very simple it's because it is <laughs> Well if it's so simple then why can't people do it or why don't people do it instead they identify one with the other and get themselves in all kinds of trouble this is the cause of suffering this is the cause of rebirth that one looks at some object in the world which could be one's own mind or thoughts or senses or body or something connected with them and says this is myself this is who i am this is me yeah 
And because of that, because these objects are changeable, impermanent, huh? unsatisfactory, and not self, actually, we suffer. Just as if you're walking down the street and you see a nice car, huh? And then you say, that's my car. No, it's not your car. <laughs> and if you get in and try to drive it away, the cops will catch you and charge you with steal stealing autos. So the same is going on, on a much larger scale, in the mind. One sees a cognizable object, whether internal or external, which has name and form, and says, that's me or that's mine. This is stealing. It's not your property. It's God's property. Because the ego feels entitled to own things, it creates karma. And the karma is just like being charged with auto theft for taking a car that's not yours, for taking a body, for taking a, a mind or other, other object and claiming it to be mine. This is theft. This is theft. So how can a thief be happy? How can someone who knows that they're wanted by the authorities be at peace? See? So the first lesson is to learn to distinguish between what is actually the self and what is not self. Of course, everything in the world has sat chit anand, it has Brahman as its substrate. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be cognizable at all. But it also has these other attributes, name and form, which are maya. They don't really exist. So the exercise that I'm going to assign everyone <laughs> this is your homework, <laughs> is to observe yourself. Sit down in a secluded, quiet place where there's no disturbance and observe yourself and observe how you think, oh, this is mine or this is me. And if you start to make a distinction between those objects and consciousness, you'll soon begin to feel an ineffable bliss. Huh? And especially when desires come up. Desires are the big one. I want this, I want that. I don't mean petty little desires like, oh, I want something to drink or eat or something like that. But I mean the big desires, especially sex desire. Sex desire is the biggie. Because everyone is a fetishist whether they <laughs> admit it or view themselves as that or not. Everybody is a fetishist. Even if your fetish is a complete, uh, normal, run-of-the-mill, cisgender, uh, going out to nightclubs and drinking <laughs> as your, as your prenuptial rights, <laughs> It's still a fetish. It's still a habit. It's still something that owns you like a monkey on your back. It's an addiction. And it doesn't matter how kinky you are or how straight you are. It's still an addiction. I know a lot of people in the so-called spiritual crowd say, well, you know, I'm, I'm straight and normal. And uh, so my sex is okay. But if somebody's kinky or queer, that's not okay. No, no, they're both not okay. Because in both cases, or in any case of sexuality, you're saying the body is mine to use as pleasure. And not only that, some other body is also mine to enjoy. This is thievery. This is a plain, straight up ripoff of God's property not your property. So yes, I know that religion and the scriptures 
allow marriage and so on. But this is a compromise. This is something given to those who cannot renounce the sex desire. Why not? Because it takes an effort of will that they're not capable of making. So out of compassion for them, to introduce them gradually to the truth, allowance for marriage and so on is made. But actually, it's, it's not correct. It's not the absolute truth. It all has to be given up. But to do that, we have to develop a strong enough willpower, a strong enough mind. We have to become convinced. We have to have the conviction that this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. And to be able to push it away. And let me tell you, the day that you can push away your sex desire out of sheer willpower... I mean, it feels like you just pressed 240 on the, on the bench, you know? It feels like you just, you just won the heavyweight championship, you know? It feels great. So this is the practice. And then in the higher level of the practice, one creates an object, a cognizable object, such as a mantra or the thought, aham brahmasmi, Tattvam Asi, Sarva Kalvidam Brahma. These are all Mahavakyas of the Vedas. And basically they mean, I am Brahma. I am Brahman. I am the self. I am the watcher, the witness, the seer. Hmm? Drishya. I am the seer, and everything that I conceive, perceive, cognize, or, or even create is not the self. So this is, I mentioned uh, the other day about the Buddhist monks who hold up a, a thing like a shield in front of their face. And what is this? It contains a color and sometimes a shape for them to use as a meditation object. But now we're doing it internally. We're doing it within the mind. And so one may uh, think of a phrase such as tatvamasi, or one may think of a, f a shape such as a god or goddess, or let's say the Sri Yantra or another Yantra, or a mantra uh, such as the Siddhi Mantra or the Mahasodashi Mantra. These are all very powerful mantras. And especially meditation on the goddess, on the mother, brings us very quickly to Brahman, to Sadashiva. So this is because of her natural attraction to him. So if we meditate on her and identify with her and see that actually all these things that we think of as I and mine are actually her, her energy, her shakti, her power. Starting with the body, the senses, the mind, the life energy, kundalini, sex energy, energy of reproduction, and all the things connected with the senses, the different sense objects, huh? the world, so-called world that we perceive. Huh? These are all her, directly. In fact, all the way up to and including consciousness itself. So none of this is I, none of this is mine, none of this is myself. These are all cognizable objects that we see as if on a screen, like watching a movie. And Brahman is like the screen itself, uh, that when all the pictures finally go away and the projector is turned off, what is left is the movie screen. Isn't it? So at this point in the subtractive process of self-realization, the practice of samadhi, we realize that the Brahman was there behind all the pictures the whole time. This is enlightenment. 
Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.